You did it. From kindergarten until now. Muscling your way through every hard moment, climbing your way up all the mountains that looked too high. You've got a lot to be proud of. You were asked for some inner strength along the way and steady character in challenging circumstances. So here you are, leaving your senior year behind, at the edge of new beginnings, a step toward fulfilling new dreams. So as you go, keep a few things in mind. Don't let others get the best of you. You control your emotions, not other people. Life is about more than making money. It's about making memories. It's about making God famous. And don't forget to call your parents. They worry about you. And remember, you are a treasured life. God formed you out of dust for such a time as this. He lights a path for you and holds you in his hands. May you follow the path God has set before you. May doors be opened before you and roadblocks disappear. And may you always be reminded that nothing is impossible with God. Well, good morning. The psalm said, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. And I'm glad to see you all here today. Those of you online, welcome. This is Pentecost Sunday, the Sunday when Jesus sent the Holy Spirit down to the earth to give the disciples not only understanding, but also that oomph to get out there and share the gospel. And that same spirit's gonna come to you this morning through word and sacrament, that you too will understand God's love for you and live that you can live a godly life in the world that uh, you live in. Pastor Tim today is going to conclude our series on timeless by looking at one of the characters of the Old Testament, David. And we can say a lot about David, but uh, what we're gonna emphasize today, Pastor Tim, is, is his godliness to help us understand how we too can be godly like David. So let's begin our worship. We're singing the opening hymn, Come Thou Almighty King, and let's rise. We begin our service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. 
I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you for your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy and bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, as a servant of the gospel, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Our entrance psalm is Psalm 104. We shall read it responsibly. How many are your works, O Lord? In wisdom you made them all. These all look to you. When you give it to them, when you open your hand, when you send your spirit, they are created. I will sing to the Lord all my life. May my meditations be pleasing to him. The Lord be with you. Let 
let us pray. Almighty God, on the day of Pentecost, you taught your faithful people by sending them your Holy Spirit. By your same Spirit, give us a right understanding in all things and joy in his presence that we might honor you through godly and faithful lives. In the name of our Jesus, we pray. Well, it's time to share the peace of the Lord. And I'm going to ask you, don't say good morning. You're in church now. Say something holy, like um, God be with you or the peace of the Lord be with you. But greet each other in the name of the Lord. God be with you. It's glad, good to see you. Thank you. Glad you're well, I'm thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Oh, God bless you, Mama. If you look in your seat back, there's some cards there um, that you can fill out to show us that you attended. It's a large church. We'd like to keep track of who's here, who's not. So please fill one out and put it in the offering plate. And there's also prayer cards. And I can guarantee you, if you have a prayer and put it on that card, it will get prayed. There will also be a person up here afterwards, uh, Mrs. Iso, to pray with you otherwise after the service. And um, don't be afraid to come. Don't think, uh, well, if I pray with her, she'll blab all over what we prayed about. <laughs> we, we trained her. And she knows she'll pray with you. And if you have something on your heart, just come up. There's assistance here for you. A little later on, we'll be praying for our 2022 graduating seniors. Um, are there any? Now, I don't say seniors. Graduating seniors. <laughs> here. Okay, uh, uh, our annual voters meeting is going to come on June 19th at 1230 here. And at this uh, <clears throat> voters meeting, we elect a board of directors for the next year and also the budget, look at the budget for the years to see where the church is going and what we're funding. So if you can at all make it, put it on your calendar, June 19th. Well, for any other information about the church um, and uh, there's website, weekly mails, newsletter, Realm, Facebook, or phone announcements. So keep in touch with the church um, as best you can. Let's read the, the scripture for today. The Old Testament reading is from 1 Samuel 17, 8 through 11, and then 45 to 47. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, he will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistine's words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. And then 45 to 47. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord, the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, 
and he will give all of you into our hands. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle for today is written in Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, the disciples were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like a blowing of a violent and violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some of them, however, made fun and said, they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the epistle of the, of the Lord. Let us rise for the gospel. <laughs> The gospel is written in the 14th chapter of St. John, beginning at verse 23. Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching." These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. This is the word of the Lord. We confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, 
by whom all things were made, who for us all and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us as an unconscious heart. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again from the grave and descended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I am now the one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Be seated, we sing the hymn for the day. God be with you. Across every page in the Old Testament, we encounter characters whom God called to lead. A man named Noah, responding in faithfulness in a faithless world. Building a boat, bringing life through the waters of destruction. We see a woman named Deborah, who led Israel's army with bravery into battle. We read the story of Daniel, lions and all, that shows us a leader with integrity even while serving under the Babylonian king. We learn of obedience from Abraham and humility from Jehoshaphat. Then there's David, who, laden with sin, sought after God with all his heart. Though these Old Testament figures are long gone, what we can learn from their stories is true. Timeless. Well, I thought maybe we would start today with a short quiz. 
I want you to let me know which of these verses are not in the Bible. Cleanliness is next to godliness. God helps those who help themselves. Confession is good for the soul. Money is the root of all evil. Honesty is the best policy. So what do you think? Which of those are and aren't in the Bible? Well, the truth is, none of those are in the Bible. They sound good and they're nice, but they're words from Gandhi and Ben Franklin and words that we have heard. So the question is, is it important if we know what is and isn't in the Bible? And of course, the answer is yes. And that's why we encourage you strongly every day, be in God's word. Have a regular time to be in God's word so you can know what his will is, what his word has to say to you, so you can accomplish his plans and not be fooled or altered by a culture that is anything but godly. And that's why every message you hear preached here is always straight out of God's word. So let's start with one of those words that we find in 2 Peter chapter 1. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that a great verse? It shows this progression, this process, this way for us to have the characteristics and the virtues that God wants us to have. Well, we're in the final week, the sixth week of this sermon series, and it's called Timeless, and we're getting these life lessons from the Old Testament. We're looking at Old Testament characters so we can learn the characteristics that they had that we should emulate. And if you've been following along, you know we've looked at words like faith and courage and integrity and obedience and humility. And they're telling us that we need to step out of our comfort zone, which is never a growing zone, it's just being complacent, and step over into the character growing zone. Today we're going to look at the character trait of godliness. Now if we just look in the dictionary, it would say it's the quality of being devoutly religious, having piety. And yet biblically it says godliness is the quality or the practice of conforming to the laws and wishes of God, reflecting the nature of the kingdom of God in the course of your everyday life. So does that mean sinless? Of course not but it means growing more and more Christ-like and being in tune with God's plans are. Because quite frankly, you could be the best parents or the most zealous church volunteer or a dynamic speaker, a good neighbor, but none of those things matter if you don't do it with godliness. So let me just ask you a question. When I say the name King David, what comes to mind? You just yell out a couple of answers. King David, what do you think of? Goliath? Goliath? Bathsheba, if you have your notes in front of you, you see a whole bunch of those words that I think come to our mind. Because when we think of David, that's what we think of. Goliath and Bathsheba, Uriah being killed and fleeing from Saul and his role as a king. And, and, and what I want us to do is to look at this roller coaster of ups and downs of David. Because today what I really want us to do is look at David and glean the timeless characteristic of godliness. And I imagine you're scratching your head and going, what? The adulterer, the murderer, he's the guy that's going to help us look at godliness. And it's true. When you look at David, he messed up more than one time in his life. He also had some wonderful victories in his life. But you see, in both of those circumstances, he had a humble heart. In both of those circumstances, when he was victorious, he gave God the credit. And when he messed up, he cried out for help. In Acts 13, it says, after removing Saul... He made David their king. God testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse. And listen to this. A man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Can you imagine God saying that about you? Putting your name in that sentence and saying, he or she is a man after my own heart. 
But we see David was known as a man of God. And consequently, he would eventually do what God wanted him to do. It's one thing to know what God wants you to do. It's certainly another thing to actually go out and do it. And David was chosen because of his heart. Interesting story. You know, uh, the Israelites wanted a king, and so Saul becomes king, and, and God has rejected him. And he tells Samuel, I want you to go choose someone else to be the king. And he says, go to the house of Jesse. So he goes to the house of Jesse, and Jesse brings all of his sons from oldest right on down to pass by. And, and, and God speaks through Samuel and says, no, not him. No, not him. No, not him. Right down the list until there's no more hymns there. And then Samuel goes, wait a minute. What about your youngest son? Oh, certainly not him. He's just a shepherd boy out in the field. God could never want to use him. And yet God works in mysterious ways, doesn't he? We read this section in 1 Samuel 16. The Lord said to Samuel, Don't consider it as appearance or as height, for I've rejected him. And then listen, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. Wow. And did you ever wonder why God chose to use David? What did he see in David that made him a godly person to be used? Well, first of all, he demonstrated faith as he faced Goliath. One of our favorite stories, right? I mean, we love this story. Goliath, this nine-foot giant, and he's, he's standing before the Israelites. He's mocking them, telling them, eh, no sense in wiping you all out. Just pick one guy. We'll fight. I'll win. That'll be the end of it. And the military men, are they're, they're dismayed. They're terrified. They're afraid. And then David, this shepherd boy, shows up. He goes, that's okay. I'll go. There he is. He walks out. He's got no armor. All he's got is a slingshot and a whole lot of faith in the Lord. And he's standing in front of this giant, full armor the giant has, ready to whomp on him. And, and listen to this story. It was read a little earlier, but David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin? Ha! I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you've defied. This day I will deliver you into my hand. I'll strike you down. I'll cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcass of the Philistine armies to the birds and the wild animals. The whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, but a battle is the Lord's, and he will give it all into your hand. How's that for faith? Standing up to the giant like that, incredible faith, so that God could work through David to defeat the Philistines and Goliath. So you might say that was great faith, but how do you get that faith? Well, it's pretty simple. God's word. David knew and he valued God's word. Now, he didn't uh, like go to a Christian bookstore or go online and get a nice leather-covered gold-leaf Bible that only sits on the shelf and looks pretty. David knew God's word. He cherished God's word. As a matter of fact, he wrote 73 of the Psalms, just like this one in Psalm 119. For I delight in your commands, because I love them. I reach out for your commands, which I love, that I may meditate on your decrees. So, great, everything's perfect, right? David's this sinless guy, going to serve the Lord, and not quite. We know the rest of the story, don't we? 2 Samuel 11. One evening, David got up from his bed. He walked around the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she's Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, wife of Uriah the Hittite. And that should have been the end of the story, right? But then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him. He slept with her. Now, she was purifying herself for her monthly uncleanliness. And then she went back home. She was conceived and gave word to David, saying, I am pregnant. Ouch, right? And yet what happens? Like us, what does David do? Well, I've sinned. I better sin a few more times to try to cover up the first sin. And he has Bathsheba's husband sent off so he'll be killed. Ouch. But then there's this guy, Nathan, this godly man. And he confronts David about his sin. I, I, do you, what do you think? Can David still be a man after God's heart after he's done this? 
Well, that's where the beauty of the law and the gospel come in. You see, the law points out the fact that we sin. It's in our nature. And then the gospel points out the fact that God forgives because it's in his nature. And we saw this live and well with David as he confesses his sinfulness. Nathan helped nudge him, show him, made him realize that he sinned and his actions are not good. And in 2 Samuel 12, we see David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And there's great verses in the Bible, they're a little long, but I'm going to share a couple of them, that show the sorrow of David's heart, his confession. Psalm 51 is a great place to go if you're wrestling with a confession. It says, have, let me just see one thing, or maybe I'm a verse off here. Oops, sorry about this, folks, let me get to the right one. Here it is. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Walk away, wash away my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression. My sin is always before me. Against you, only you have I sinned. Done what is evil in your sight. So you're right in your verdict and justified when you judge. David had a broken heart, a contrite heart. Uh, and, and then his prayer continues in this psalm. I recite this next part often because I think it's where God wants me to focus every morning when I get up. I simply say, as David did, create me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Now, when we look at David, the story gets interesting and, and kind of challenging when we see that David waited patiently for God's timing. Think about this story for a minute. He's anointed, but he's not going to be the king for a while. Not so fast here. Because Samuel anoints him, doesn't make him king instantly. Uh, it signals that God has chosen him. And we see that the Spirit comes on him in 1 Samuel 16. Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the presence of the brothers, and from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And yet, Saul's the king, right? And Saul hates David. Saul is jealous of David. Saul wants to kill David. And David's fleeing. He's on the run. And oh, by the way, he had opportunities to kill Saul. And he could have justified it in his mind, but no, no, he waited patiently for God's timing. As a matter of fact, 15 years he waited. And in 2 Samuel 5, when the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, the king made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old, he became king, and he reigned for 40 years. So what have we learned so far? Well. We learn that David was a man after God's own heart because he demonstrated faith. He committed to following the Lord in his actions. And he was tested and he failed many times. And yet after his sin, he always confessed, received forgiveness. And he loved God's word so much and he followed it directly. And so he's a good illustration for us on what a godly life can look like having godliness in our lives. So great stories. We love the stories of David, and you're going, okay, big deal, that was fun. Now what are we going to do? Now what? Well, the now what is what I want you to look at. How about you? If you were to ask the 10 closest people in your life to describe you, would anyone mention the word godliness? Think about that for a minute. Maybe not. So let's compare you to David as we just looked at Number one, do you love the Lord with all your heart? Now, we love the donuts being back on Sunday morning. We love when the Browns win on a Sunday. We love sunny days. And we step that level of love up a little bit when we say, well, I love my wife or my kids, my country. But ultimately, who do you love? Where's your heart? Who's your first love in your life? Who do you owe it all to? Well, Mark tells us that we should love the Lord our God. How? With all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. And when we love the Lord, we're going to love other people because that's what God calls us to do. One night in New York on Broadway, 
actress Mary Martin uh, to prepare to go on stage. She's done it a thousand times before uh, Roger Hammerstein's South Pacific. She's just ready to walk on stage and she's handed a note. It actually is a note from Oscar Hammerstein. He's on his deathbed. And here's what he wrote. Dear Mary, a bell's not a bell until you ring it. A song's not a song until you sing it. Love in your heart is not put there to stay. Love isn't love until you give it away. And then she went on stage. And when she came back, the whole cast rushed her and said, what in the world happened? We've never seen you perform like that before. And she read the note to them. And then she looked at them and said, tonight I gave my love away. It fits very well with the Bible and with what Jesus says. He asked Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes. What did he say? Feed my sheep. Basically, Jesus was saying to Peter, hey, you got a song, go sing it. Uh, hey, Peter, you got a bell, go ring it. Hey, Peter, love's not love unless you give it away. So how about you? Do you demonstrate a godly love to the people around you? Number two, do you step out in faith? Faith is this confidence in, in what we hope for, an assurance of things that we can't see. And, and do you trust Jesus as Lord and Savior even when life gets tough? And then do you follow his lead? Do you do a trust walk? And the big question is, who or what is the Goliath in your life? It's right in front of you, and yet you're fearful maybe that God won't help you defeat it. Maybe it's an addiction that the Lord wants you to have sobriety over. Maybe it's a relationship that you know is not pleasing to the Lord. Maybe it's to step out in faith and to share the gospel with someone that you know at work or in the neighborhood. Is God going to someday look at you and say, as he did in Matthew 25, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'm going to put you in charge of many things. Come and share the master's happiness. Do you seek God's will? Or are you one of those who say, Lord, tell me what you want me to do. La, 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 la. I can't hear you, Lord, so I guess you don't want me to do anything. Keep quiet, alone time with God. Seek his will. Trust him. And he's going to guide you. So you can step out of the comfort zone. and Get into the character zone. He's got a plan for you, by the way. Every single one of you watching online. Every single one of you in this room. For I, you are God's handiwork created in Jesus Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for you to do. Are you in sync with God's will, and then are you stepping out in faith? Number three, do you value God's word? Right? David did. Colossians 3 says, let the message of Christ, that's his word, dwell in you richly. As you teach and admonish one another with wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your heart. Have you ever put on a long coat, lots of buttons, you get all done, and whoops, something's wrong here. You got an extra button and no more buttonhole. Well, what went wrong? Well, I'll tell you what went wrong. You didn't get the first button right. And after that, everything is out of whack. It's the same thing in your spiritual journey, folks. If God's not at the beginning and the foundation, everything in your life is going to be out of whack. God tells us to seek first his kingdom, and then all things will fall in as well. Make God your priority, your number one, and then all the buttons in your overcoat, so to speak, will fall in place. And his word is so sweet for us. All scriptures God breathes, it's useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. So the servant of God will be fully equipped for every work. Sounds important, sounds helpful, sounds great. And remember, Satan is the enemy. He wants to tempt, give you temptation not to follow God or to get into his word. But God's word's all powerful. And then number four, do you confess and repent of your sin? Wow, this can be tough in our culture today, can't it? Uh, we learn from early on to uh, rationalize things. Well, it's not that bad. Well, God didn't really care if I do this once. Or maybe blame somebody else. Well, I had to do it. Or everybody else is doing it. Or uh, it's just a small sin. And we start to water everything down. Do you have a Nathan in your life that will challenge you? Because 1 John is very clear. 
If you claim to be without sin, you deceive yourself, and the truth is not in you. That's the law again. It condemns you. You need to feel the fact that you have sinned and hurt God. And then the beauty of the gospel. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just. He'll forgive your sins and purify you from unrighteousness. Honestly assess your life, your thoughts, your words, your actions, the things you do, the things you omit to do. And then number five, how's your patience? Ouch, huh? I got to admit, and I don't do it pridefully, I'm just saying I struggle with this. I mean, we live in this instant gratification world, right? Fast food, microwave meals, minute rice. 5G speed so we can have the world at our fingertips. And that works for a little while. And then suddenly things don't go your way or troubles come along. This very short, powerful little verse here, Romans 12, is a neat one. It says to be joyful in hope. But listen to this middle part. Patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. God wants you to come to in prayer, but then he wants you to wait for his perfect timing. Now remember, we just talked about the fact that David waited 15 years patiently. Moses and the Israelites waited 40 years. Abraham and Sarah waited 25 years. She was 90 years old when she had Isaac. Jacob waited 14 years for Rachel, and Joseph waited 13 years in prison and out before he could finally make amends with his brothers. And Joe, uh, Noah waited 120 years, and a prodigal son waited for his, his a prodigal father waited for his son to return, and Ruth waited for Naomi, and on and on and on and on. And yet here's the point. Every single one of those stories ended wonderfully in God's timing. So are you patient? If you're not, fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. Pray to God, let the Holy Spirit, especially as we have this Pentecost day, think of the Holy Spirit coming and giving you patience. So what makes a godly person? Well, a godly person is someone that lives their life with respect for and obedience to God, love for and informed with God's word, depending on God, stepping out in faith. Now, there's one of my favorite sections is Philippians 4. If any of you know me personally, you know I love that section. But there's a section there that will help us figure out what things help us to live godly lives. It's Philippians 4, verses 8 and 9. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received from me or seen in me, put it into practice. The God of peace will be with you. You see what it's all about? Thinking the right thoughts and then putting them into practice to live that life of godliness. So a couple action steps as you walk out of here today. Are you ready to say that I'm going to start reading God's word daily? I mean daily. The same time every day. God, this is your moments. I'm going to start my day. 15 minutes maybe. I'm going to be in your word or in a devotion. Maybe you start with what I just read so you get that whatever's true, right, and normal part in your mind. Secondly, I already confess your sins. Don't blame somebody else. That's just being lame. Don't rationalize it. It's just rational lies. Own your sins and ask God to forgive them. And then step out in faith as God nudges you. Face your Goliath. Lord, thank you for your word. It's so sweet, so powerful, so loving for the timeless characteristics and virtues that we can learn from your Old Testament leaders. Fill us with faith and courage and integrity and obedience and humility. And then fill us with godliness. Keep us close to your word and help us then to step forward and act upon your play, plans in our timing. We pray it in your name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Tim. <clears throat> because of your generosity, um, a lot of stuff happens at this church. Um, I don't know if you know this, but uh, the church recognizes those who work at it uh, in five-year increments. And just, just recently, uh, we have 16 staff who, who had 10 years or more of service and 14 who have committed to over 20 years of service 
working at the church, and you made that all possible. These are people who God has given talent, and they've used it because you supported them, and just want to say thank you to that. Let's sing uh, our next hymn, a hymn of reflection. We'll worship the king, and we'll take our offering at that time. Let me ask first if there are any graduating seniors here this morning. Okay, let's rise. We'll include the seniors in our prayers this morning. Lord, we want to be a godly people. That's what we're doing here. We want to worship you because that's a godly thing to do. We want to learn more about you so that as we go back out into our lives, we may know you, that we may believe in you. We might have faith in you and act in our lives because we are your people. Oh Lord, give us the desire of our hearts and make those desires godly desires. Give us patience to wait for them and help us to act on our godliness, to be your people out in the world. We ask, O oh Lord, for some sick people in recovering. Um, this morning uh, at the other church service, at, at the other room, somebody was taken out of there and taken to the hospital. So we pray for that person along with Elaine Vatsky and William, the son of Annette and Dave Breeze, Mike Cropper, Coach Woody, Linda Goman, Richard Pop Papson, Shirley Rhinus, Chris Reiner, Sarah Sweeney, Millie Thompson, and Gail Vitek. These are members of our body, Lord. And when some of the body is hurting, the whole body hurts. And so we bring these people before your throne of grace, asking for your mercy to be upon them, to give them hope and life and patience, and to give them, if it is your will, healing. Oh Lord, it is such a joyous time when a little one is baptized. We thank you that William Ralph Friedman, whose parents Steve and Mia have brought him to your house in order for you to adopt him as your child. That's just the beginning. Be with him, put your Holy Spirit upon him, and help him and his parents to live godly lives. We thank you that today at the 11 o'clock service, Lucas Hanky, Hackney, I'm sorry, who was uh, ill on Confirmation Day, and will now today be confirmed. Let him confirm his faith before you and let that confirmation be uppermost in his mind as he lives out his life to your glory. Now, we pray for those who are hurting, affected, those affected by the shootings in Uvendil, 
uh, Uvalde, Texas, and also Tulsa, Oklahoma. And just like that last night, some more shootings. Oh Lord, when will it end? You're the Lord in charge of things. Please bring peace and harmony to our land. We also pray for peace in the Ukraine. God, take a hand in this. Bring peace to these people. It's not right. We ask you to be with them. Bless all the nation's leaders and give them wisdom and guidance so that we may enjoy peace in our day. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. You may be seated. This special meal that we call Holy Communion, God comes to us himself in, in, through bread and wine. We ask as we examine ourselves, am I a baptized person? Am I a sinful human being that needs salvation? Do I find that salvation in my Lord Jesus Christ who died and rose again for me? Do I believe his promise that in some wonderful way through bread and wine, he comes to be right within me and because of that do I promise that it's going to affect me that this next week I'll live a more godly life than I have last week if you can answer yes to those this meal is for you our Lord Jesus Christ on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said take eat this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, said, Take and drink, this is my blood, which is shed for the forgiveness of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you.
the blessing of the Lord as you leave this place. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.